maybe can we start very basic um, and explain what loss aversion is? Yeah, I mean, this is this is not such an easy question, right? As you might think. Uh, I mean, to me, I mean, that's that's uh, sort of a reaction. Uh, we could think about it as sort of a. I mean, going back to Kahneman Tversky, of course, it's it's uh, it's the outcome that is coded as a loss in you know relation to some reference point. And of course, this is the reference point here. It's kind of the trick, right? What, what is the reference yeah. point, and and how to think about that, and 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 so on. And often in experiments, what we do is kind of manipulate this in one way or the other with framing. We give people some money, and then we we say we're gonna take them away. So, and then we interpret this, or we we hope, or we, we kind of uh, assume that the participants they frame this as a loss. And uh, if people then treat those losses differently, I mean, depending on on how we frame things, I mean, we call that, uh, or we could, I mean, call it loss aversion. If you have a, a sort of a higher reaction to losing, you know, say a dollar, than you have to to gaining a dollar. But I mean, the definition is if, if you go into it, you know, how, how to define it, you know, you have different types. Some people go in and try to measure, you know, the derivative as uh, you approach zero from both sides and say that, OK, let's say the derivative of the utility function or the value function on the negative domain is steeper than the derivative on the positive domain. So you react more to losses uh, yeah. than gains. In how should I say in some technical way, like that's that's how loss aversion is defined, right? In terms of the slope of the curve. So, like one one thing that I really so I actually did a study where I compared losses and gains in um, a, a prisoner dilemma at first, um, where the outcome could be losses or gains or combination of them, that kind of thing. And what I realized, I always talked about loss aversion, but I actually didn't really mean technically what the definition of loss aversion was. And it took me quite a while to realize that um, I was being very imprecise about what exactly I meant by loss aversion. Um, because I didn't really mean it as a difference in slope, but more like a, a step um, between mm -hmm. gains yeah. and losses okay. kind of thing. And then I, like, just afterwards I realized like, oh, that leads to a completely different prediction than what I've always said, <laughs> what I was using with loss aversion. One th kind of question I had here almost was, I always found that a lot of or a lot of papers I've read have used this phrase, losses loom larger than gains. And it seems to me that the rhetoric of that has almost, which is, you know, a nice rhetorical technique, uh, but is very imprecise. Do you think that's contributed to that? Or I don't know, it just seems to me that everyone just says losses loom larger than gains and then just do whatever they want to do. Um, I haven't thought about the exact phrase, but I've noticed the same thing as you experienced, that loss aversion is often used in a kind of sloppy and non-precise way. It's actually, I, I read about loss aversion on a Wikipedia page. I don't know if it's still there, but they then exemplified this by uh, the Asian uh, so-called, let's call it Asian disease problem. And... Um, it's not about loss aversion. <laughs> so it was, uh, I think it was uh, perhaps on the only time, you know, that I felt, okay, maybe here I should do an edit and think about this. This is typically referred to as the reflection effect, right? Where you have different uh, risk attitudes on yeah, the positive yeah. and negative domain. It's not exactly the same thing as loss aversion. But yeah, it has to do with reference points and you frame the outcomes as losses, but uh, it's not loss aversion per se that's driving this effect. So that's another example that people are, you know, uh, a little bit, uh, I think, sloppy and imprecise when it comes to uh, defining and thinking about uh, loss aversion. I mean, so you did a study about loss aversion. Is your definition the original technical definition or how do you, I mean, it's, so it's in the title, right? So you have to. Yeah, I think we are not. So, we are also contributing to this sloppiness, perhaps <laughs> a little bit in this paper. I don't know, but we have uh, we have different ways. It, it's not easy, and it doesn't make it more easy if you uh, you know make the uh, utility function richer or if you have a more complex structure. I mean, if you really want to you know apply, for example, prospect theory with probability weighting, and you might allow for differences in probability weighting on the positive and negative domain. 
you might allow for different ras risk attitudes on the positive and negative domain. And then you should also estimate the kink or this kind of loss aversion uh, aspect. You, you, you realize, I mean, there are many parameters here to estimate. And, uh, uh, we don't go that deep in this paper. So we use a kind of a very uh, brute force uh, approach where we just look at uh, the number of risky choices when there are losses involved and uh, when there are no only gains. And then we do estimate some sort of structural models, but that then depend on on um, on certain assumptions on functional forms of the underlying utility functions. Okay. Um, can you then uh, briefly summarize the kind of main findings of your paper, deciding for others reduced loss aversion? I guess the title already says quite a lot. Yeah, um, exactly. So I think the the the, the title says it all or says uh, the main message here, the take home message is that we had this online experiment uh, in Denmark. We uh, invited people to uh, uh, to a web page where they made choices. And these choices were over gambles, so they made these kind of risky choices. Then we had four different treatments. So we had one treatment where subjects made decisions on their own behalf basically like a standard experiment they uh, make a number of choices and then afterwards we pick one and we pay them according to that uh, decision so this is a kind of traditional risky gamble right you have two options and each has two potential outcomes uh with exactly exactly different, so ma different uh, magnitudes yeah. uh, and then we have we had a hypothetical scenario where basically the same, but they were not paid. And then we had two treatments that involved others. So one treatment where they only made decisions on behalf of someone else, so they were not paid themselves. And then we had another treatment where you took a decision that uh, you kind of shared with another person. So you and this other person got the same outcome. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was kind of the main setup. And then we had these kind of gambles. Some of them were framed as purely gains, so you could only win money, basically, whatever happened. And then we had some uh, gambles that in, then involved losses. So there were some potential losses to be made if you were unlucky. What we then do is basically compare behavior between these treatments. And uh, I mean, first of all, it was quite striking to some degree. I mean, when it and only look at those gambles that involved gains where you only can make money, there were completely no difference between treatments, right? So whether you made decisions on your own behalf or on um, together with someone else or where you shared the outcome or whether you did it uh, hypothetically, I mean, it didn't play a role. So basically the number of safe choices, uh, uh, estimated risk parameters, if we do it in a structural estimation was uh, very similar. But if we then put attention on our, on those uh, situations where they could potentially lose money, I mean, then we find that people take um, uh, less risk when they make decisions on their own behalf. So when in this kind of standard situation where you are the only one that are bearing the consequences of, of your actions. So that's where the title comes from then. As soon as yeah. someone else was involved, you know, you take... Um, more risk so that means here that the one interpretation is of course on that they are less loss averse yes yeah, so i have i have a few, maybe a little like first a few slightly technical questions and then yeah. um slightly broader questions one thing um that slightly confuses me is that when i look at figure one right so you have uh, the two panels one is the no loss one is the loss uh, conditions and then you have the uh, average number of safe choices per uh, treatment you call it which is individual hypothetical both or other um those are, that's figure one and what i find slightly confusing is so it's it's obvious to me to see that there's no difference between the conditions and the no loss conditions but there are differences in the loss condition but what i find slightly confusing is that it seems to me that the the number of safe choices for individual for myself is identical between no loss and loss so how exactly 
it seems to me like that there's basically when i just look at the figure at least it seems to me like there's no difference between the loss and the no loss condition for individual okay that's a that's um that's a relevant question and i know when you ask it i remember i've gotten this when i presented the papers uh, the <laughs> okay. paper, uh, and i think this is really i mean these are not the gambles don't have the same expected value they don't have the same variance so there is no reason actually to 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 expect uh choices or number of safe choices to be the same between the treatments mm -hmm. so um this just happens i think to be the case so if you if you look at the details of of uh, the choices uh, or the, the gambles they were choosing between you know there's uh, there could be many reasons you know i, I it could be more um there could be a higher there could be you know this can depend on the payoff structure of the gambles let's put it that way yeah that was basically the other question i had is kind of so if you if you look at the table one where you have the different um where you 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 list all the gambles in the study right um i was also confused that somehow like you, you know i'm a mainly experimental um psychologist or neuroscientist and what surprised me as the first thing is that the gambles weren't kind of kept identical apart from the loss no loss condition so for example i mean the one thing that i noticed immediately is that in the so you always have a left gamble and a right gamble right and you have to choose which one you want and for the losses the left gamble always had a much two or three times as large difference between the two options as the as in the no loss conditions um so in the let's say in in screen four heads is minus nine and tails is 40 uh, always and in the no loss condition heads is 72 and tails is 86 so just like the the outcome of that gamble uh, you know there's a much larger difference and that's always the case uh, i mean it does that partly explain why figure one seems slightly confusing um, that, as, as you said, like the expected utility of each gamble isn't the same. Is, is yeah. that kind of what you so, meant? So that could or? be, yeah, yeah. So, so that's that could be one of the explanations. You know, why you have more. Uh, you would expect there to be more um, more safe gambles on the no loss, or more safe choices on the no loss screens, right? Yeah, but why? Uh, just from a like practical perspective, now why not keep, for example the difference they're the same and see what i mean like it seems to me like yeah if if if, if, if you know as a second year or third year phd student who doesn't know much if i would have set up an experiment i would have kept it exactly the same and just subtracted something or something like that right yeah i mean uh, i think you're asking a very good question and uh to be honest, you know, now it has passed more than 10 years since we designed these questions. <laughs> and I must be all totally honest. And I don't really <laughs> recall how we came up with these parameters, to be honest. So, okay. I mean, it seems like, um, seems like uh, we could have made them a little bit more, as you say, we could probably have made, uh, we could have had some lower payouts perhaps in one of these no loss cases yeah yeah okay so <laughs> it's lost to the mystery of time okay but then basically those those two questions i had though kind of exp at least one explains the other kind of the yeah i i, I mean if you if we do the structural estimation we do find loss aversion on on both uh, the no loss and the loss uh, domain, right? So it's, it's not like there is no underlying loss aversion in the individual tree. And that's, as you into is, is due to, you know, the construction of the table. It doesn't show up in, uh, in the figure. I see. Okay. Okay. I mean, I guess the broad question is kind of like, why do we not have loss aversion when deciding for others? And the one thing that maybe confused me almost most is that um, you have no loss aversion when you're deciding for yourself and for someone else. Somehow I would have expected that that condition would have been more like self rather than other. So I don't know. Yeah, what do you think is kind of driving this effect that you observe in the study? 
Yeah, I mean, these are really good and interesting questions. And I, I mean, we don't know. I mean, we speculate here right at the end. And what we propose here is that as soon as you involve someone else, you kind of uh, put yourself in those shoes more than if you're doing it alone. So just the mere fact that someone else is involved makes you, you know, uh, start to concern about the other's health. And then this is, in this case, enough to uh, to shift your behavior. But uh, exactly what's going on there? I mean, that's a, that's a that's a very good question, and I would be I would love to 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 see some young PhD students, you know, looking more into this. Yeah, I mean, you have um, I haven't read the other paper. You have another paper about is it risky choices for others, or that people make more risky choices when deciding for others, or something like that. Um, do you know which paper I'm referring to, or? Yeah, we have another paper, but that's yeah, that's also on um, on risk taking on behalf of others. I'm just curious whether that m might s give us some sort of like the two combined give us some sort of general idea of how people change their decision making once they switch from their own frame to someone else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, first of all, I think when talking about these issues, we have to realize that this is. Probably, and there is some evidence for it, of course, that this is context dependent. You know, it depends on on what kind of the framing of the situation. Now we're talking about financial risk, but if you were talking about health or safety and so on, um, you know, if I make decisions on behalf of someone else's kids when I drive, you know, I would probably be more on the, you know, the cautious side rather than on the, you know, risky side so you have a different you know uh, different effect of going from individual to decision making for others so i think that's also very you know important just to keep at the back of our mind here when we talk about this issue that uh, there are differences between you know the settings actually the the point about the important about the setting and the context is something i was I think talking to her recently to someone in the lab that I kind of got frustrated that a lot of stuff you find out just depends on context. That whatever you find out is true in like one context rather than a general finding. I mean, I, I just, we talked about it because I was just a bit frustrated. Um, <laughs> but how do you, I don't know, how do you think about that? Like it's because it seems to me that like it's kind of, I, I found it just a bit frustrating, the idea that like kind of if you have something and it's just like a minuscule finding about some specific social context and as soon as you change one of 30 different parameters, potentially, potentially like everything can change about the behavior. Is that, I don't know, is that something that you've, or like when you design a study, for example, like I guess you have to take the context into account, right? So how do you decide which context to do or how to do something that maybe generalize across contexts or do you not care or well I, I really do think we should care and uh, uh, i think this was also one of the reasons why economists at least for a long time you know when doing experiments they preferred this kind of neutral frames and so on because it was assumed that if you have a neutral frame and we just induce the preferences with the, uh, incentives you know you get more generalizable findings, you know, compared to a situation where you have, uh, you give cues, you give more uh, detailed descriptions of things, you might give context and so on. So so that was really, I mean, kind of one of the uh, hallmarks or one of the, you know, building blocks of experimental e economics, you know, to, to move away or to remove one of a lot of these context parts. And I think that's a sound methodology, but I mean, a sound approach. But on the other hand, there is always a context as well, right? So yeah. uh, even the neutral context might be a context, you know, in some sense. So, uh, and if the, the, the rest of the world is full of context, you know, how, how solid are those findings then? But um, we don't know. I mean, um, uh, so, so I think it's still, I mean, a trained economist, I still think it's, it's a good starting point, you know, to have this as, you know, somehow context free. Uh, you should have the context free context, you know, to, yes. to start with. And then we can, you know, start to try to understand how easy it is to, to um, generalize or extend these findings to, to other situations. But I, I do agree. I mean, I agree that this is, of course, a 
partly frustrating as well, you know. Uh, but um, it's also fascinating in some sense as well. I mean, it, it, it requires more work. It requires more data, bigger data, more more studies, you know, before we can say things with confidence. I think uh, um, some of the claims that you would have made maybe, you know, <laughs> 30 years ago based on one small study you, you cannot do today, which I think is, a, of course, a sound uh, kind of development. So it's a, it's a challenge and it's a frustration, but it's also, I think, reality. Yeah. I mean, maybe, um, you know, as I said, I'd like to talk about the relationship between economics and psychology or kind of what the different perspectives are. And maybe one thing I've always been slightly confused by is for example, your this this paper we just mentioned, right? Deciding for others reduces loss aversion. To me, that's a straightforward psychology experiment. I don't understand exactly how economics or economies or what exactly they why they are interested in this kind of thing. So, like, what? I mean, because to me, this is just about how people make decisions, which is for me psychology. I don't know. I'm just curious, like, what's the for you personally, maybe like what? Why are you doing these kind of studies or? Or why do you, because you said, you know, you're a trained economist and that kind of stuff. Why does that fall into what you're interested in, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, it's a perfect, uh, <laughs> fine question. So so this project, just to give an example, you know, it started in, in the wake of the financial crisis. So there was a lot of uh, risk taking and uh, some say ex excessive risk taking. And uh, the question was, okay, why why is this? Or uh, there are many, you know, explanations. And uh, often her, you often hear explanations like incentives shape risk attitudes, right? Or risk taking. So maybe it was just misaligned incentives uh, in the financial sector that led to this. So that was one explanation uh proposed but there was also others you know that yeah these are greedy people or unreliable you know bankers and, and they are taking too much risk on behalf of their clients you know so with that as a starting point you know before you can say anything about the effects of incentives the basic question is then okay you, yeah what if we remove the incentives okay would there still be differences right so this is the first step that we try to take there, right? So we, we try to remove the incentive to keep it as simple as possible. And of course, then we are kind of down to psychology in some sense. We are, we are looking at uh, uh, differences in behavior when... But it's also about, uh, for an economist, you know, very relevant behaviors, right? So this is about risk-taking in a financial domain. So... Uh, as I said, you know, if you want to make claims, then why do uh, someone take more risk than another? You could think about incentives, but you could also think about these kind of underlying uh, differences in how we perceive the situations when we make decisions on our own behalf or behalf of our clients or someone else. So we started this research uh, program. So this was one paper, which was the kind of basic first step. And then we added incentives you know to see okay what if we provide incentives which um, look a little bit like they do in the financial sector uh, will that increase uh, risk taking on behalf of others and will it do so for everyone or are there some sort of offsetting mitigating effects you know and um, that's what we we then study with for example we find that the degree of social preferences so people that care more for others or also responding less to you know uh, incentives to take uh, risk for others or take excessive excessive risk for others so it's um i think you know at the bottom of this um you have uh, at the bottom of, of, of the economy you have humans right so it's 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 natural for an economist to try to understand how those uh, humans uh, act and interact when it comes to these kind of uh, economically important behaviors okay so the the kind of ultimate goal is to understand the economy and because humans are basically what make the economy um that's yeah. why it's a relevant question for you yeah and i also think that's um i mean talking about the differences between psychology and economics i also think that's um also uh, 
you know, describing a big difference between, you know, how we set up our problems, how we view our problem, and particular probably how we motivate our problems or exactly, our yeah. research uh, questions, right? So we start often from, I think more often from, you know, some real world, you know, economic phenomena, you know, that we, we, we want to provide information and knowledge on and, and hopefully in the end even things like you know policy recommendations and <laughs> and, uh, and these kind of things we we have this pressure in some sense to always have a policy recommendation in every paper and you don't have that i guess in psychology as much <laughs> no not really i mean what i find interesting is that in a way from i mean of course when i say economics what i have in mind is the papers from economics that i've read which means of course they are by definition, those that are much closer to psychology anyway, because that's the kind of stuff I happen to be interested in. So there's probably like, I mean, there's lots of economics uh, that I can identify very clearly as being what I would imagine economics is. Um, so maybe in a way, I'm just sampling from a, a non-representative sample within economics papers that's very um, possible. Um, but one thing I just realized is that when you said with the policies is that it seems to me that kind of economics in some sense is if you're trying to apply it to policies immediately is almost more applied than psychology but i've also read a lot of economics papers that are very theoretical and that seem almost a lot less applied than psychology almost as if economics is like the the outside extremes <laughs> and then psychology is kind of the middle of it i don't know whether that makes sense but um it just occurred to me as you said that. Yeah, no, I, I also, I mean, economics is a very broad field, right? Yeah. So I guess you can find um, both ends of the spectrum here. You know, you, as you say, you know, you have things that are totally abstract, you know, totally, you know, stripped of any context and, and this is pure theory in some sense, right? And then on the other hand, you have really applied stuff that really tries to to give direct uh, more policy or test testing different things or diff evaluating different programs and, uh, and policies. So I think you have the whole spectrum, maybe more than you do in psychology. I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know psychology well yeah. enough to... to I mean, in some sense, maybe I'm also pretending psychology is less applied than it is just because I'm not interested in clinical stuff. So, you know, of course, if you're... A lot yeah, of people no, motivate no. their psychological interests yeah. that way, where I, whereas I don't. <laughs> but yeah, it's just... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe there is more, you know, kind of interaction within economics than there is within psychology. I don't know. I mean, because here we have the Department of Economics and most behavioral economists and experimental economists, they work in departments of economics, so they interact with all kinds of uh, economists every day from different fields and um, which of course means that you have to motivate what you do from also from their point of view to some degree uh, but um, i don't know maybe in psychology you have more this uh, division between the more let's say theoretical or judgment decision making that kind of branch and then you have the clinical psychology which is quite different i would imagine yeah but maybe yeah uh... I don't know. Maybe, maybe the kind of clinical stuff is the equivalent of policy recommendations, just that you're trying to, I don't know, heal the economy, whereas we are trying to heal yeah. people or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it also occurred to me because I had one discussion about um, with Paul Smodino. He's a, well, he does a lot of different things, but he usually does them from a theoretical background of modeling. Um, and we had a kind of discussion about modeling, um, formal modeling. And we kind of were wondering whether psychology has out outsourced its theoretical part to economics or something. Um, uh -huh. Because sometimes I really read like papers, I think, oh yeah, this is a really cool paper. And then I realize it's an e in an economics journal and then it's just 20 pages of maths or something. And um, a bit trickier to read for me as someone who doesn't have that training. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you, you, do consider yourself an economist and i mean is the kind of applied policy stuff for you something that's just for you personally actually is that how you think about it or is that more like a kind of distant kind of like where do you position yourself on the 
applied to theoretical continuum? Yeah, I guess also um, I'm more on the applied side. Well, depends. You know, we also have something called applied uh, microeconomics, which is more like empirical, which is is, is I see. have necessarily to be applied. So, but uh, uh, as a you know, more experimental behavioral econ- economist, I'm somewhere in between. You know, somehow the applied uh, economics and the more traditional microeconomics, I would say. So, some some of my work is more leaning towards. Uh, standard micro which is more abstract less applied but then on the other hand i often involve real people and so on which uh, and and, and this try to kind of measure and investigate decisions of real people so that puts me in a little bit more on the applied side in one sense yeah i have um this is a question that i think is uh, very much a technical specific not even technical but a kind of nitpicky question about economics which is why exactly from what i can tell economics papers can take years between submission i mean like you said you started yours in 2010 which surprised me because it's published in 2016 um, and i've seen other economics papers where it said like we uh, collected the data then and then like eight years later the paper came out or I, I mean, once I literally saw on a paper, it said, like, submitted, like, I don't know, 2012 and published 2019 or something. Um, what exactly are you guys doing in the <laughs> in your peer review process? And what, I don't know, is there something that, I mean, in psychology, I think we feel like we take a long time to peer review this whole stuff. But is there something we can learn from that? Or is it, are you just slow with admin or what's happening? Uh, yeah, I think the reports are quite different. First thing, I think sometimes the reviewers are more like, you know, a co-author than yeah. a, a reviewer, you know, so you can get up uh, to five pages, you know, of comments. And then in some journals, you have four of those and then uh, they request more and more data and uh, new experiments and new analysis and so on. So it's, um, it is slow and uh, it's getting faster luckily so i hope we will be able to 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 change the norm a little bit uh, and then you have this development you know in economics that uh, papers i mean you in some sense you have two developments right so over the last uh, decades you know you've had uh, the development of more bigger and bigger papers somehow you know it's it's i just published a paper you know i think all in all with appendices and stuff, it's like 100, 150 pages or something, you know, it was one of those papers that took yeah, three years in, in the refereeing it's process. basically a book. And started with, yeah, it's it's almost like you are back to writing monographs in the PhD yeah. programs in economics, but now it's called the job market paper. So that's <laughs> supposed to be, you know, uh, 40 pages in the, the, and then an appendix of, I don't know, 100 pages. So it, you're supposed to basically meet all potential objections within this paper rather than you know writing a short follow-up or Mm -hmm. a a comment and so on so it's supposed to be almost uh uh, it's a it's supposed to answer most of the critical concerns already within the within the same sort of paper so i think that's a different stance a little bit towards if you compare it with with other fields so uh, on the one hand we've had that development so uh papers and appendices have been growing but then there is also oh, just over the recent you know five years or so there is an alternative trend to uh, for, especially from from journals you know to open up for shorter papers so you have the leading uh, journals like american economic review now have you know a short version of it and you have restart you have the, 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 many of the big journals are now you know uh, opening up and actively you know inviting shorter papers so i think that's kind of a reaction to this other uh, development that all findings does not uh, uh, do not fit into you know this kind of huge paper format you could have a nice you know result and an important finding which is perhaps just five ten pages yeah i mean yeah one thing i was wondering is so it sounds like the I should say that in economics, the attempt is more to solve 
not all, but most of the problem, potential problems with an idea within a paper, whereas I think in maybe psychology or something, you're more likely to just write three more papers and then to kind of take it yeah. step by step. I'm wondering, so I mean, in a sense, I feel like the the the, meth, the the approach from psychology is maybe psychologically a bit nicer because you have these like smaller wins along the way. But I'm curious whether maybe the economics is actually almost ironically more efficient because once you have a paper, you're more confident that it's good and reliable and you don't have to read four papers that might end up being almost longer than the one paper um, just because you've kind of managed to really condense it into one really strong piece um, so that, I don't know, I wonder like whether it might actually be more efficient because you kind of, uh, there's less, there's fewer papers to read, um, there's less questioning how reliable the results are and that kind of stuff. Does that make sense or is it just, I don't know, no, I think it's a good comment, and I guess there is this trade-off, right? On the one hand, as you say, it's kind of uh, kind of demotivating to work on, on on papers for five years, and then in the end, maybe you get rejected. You know, <laughs> if you, if you yeah, most, I guess, psychology would say that it's better to to break it down to smaller pieces. On the other hand, as you say, you know, reading some of these papers is also very nice. You know, if you if you feel that this is solid, I, and you can. Uh, you get answers already within this paper to some of your concerns or questions, you know, in these robustness checks and, and alternative specifications and whatnot that's provided within the paper rather than having to, you know, uh, look up um, five other papers that yeah. are published uh, subsequently. But, you yeah. know. But like one of the reason why I kind of um, asked the question is because, for example, we have, so this thing I mentioned earlier with gains and losses in the prison dilemma. So I did that fairly early on in my PhD and it kind of worked out fairly neatly. We basically found, I guess, what we call loss avoidance in people's behavior there and it kind of fit very neatly. But then I thought, well, prison dilemma is just one context, right? Um, or it's only one of the two by two games. And actually, we I should, like, if, if this is a general finding, it should also apply to stag hunt and chicken on you know all these other kind of games so i thought like, okay if we actually want to make this a general finding then we repeat the entire thing with all these other games and that's i mean we did a brief part of that and it seems to kind of work but the weird thing is then it seems to me almost like i now I, if i if i do the latter thing i almost don't need the first paper anymore because i've got the general findings so in a way us publishing the prison dilemma study first almost is a waste of everyone's time because like as soon as you have the general finding you just don't need the small thing anymore and we were probably going to end up doing it as two separate papers anyway um in part uh for some practical reasons and that kind of stuff but yeah it is this weird thing sometimes where i feel like you yeah the latter paper makes the former paper almost unnecessary to read for anyone um yeah maybe you know exposed in a sense but the reason that the second paper came into being was the first paper right? exactly yeah, yeah so in some sense if you view it you know not uh, in terms of the you know broader perspective here is that uh, because of the first finding uh, you uh, got interested in this and you you were motivated to write this bigger paper and then um, has its uh, contribution in this uh, science and the process of science as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for me personally, it's a, it was a great learning experience and this whole like thinking about how can I make the, the how can I test the findings in the most generalizable way and that kind of stuff. That was like really very useful, uh, I think, um, for me as a scientist. But then I do wonder sometimes like making it to two papers is kind of, I don't know, you know, you know what I mean? Like the... Uh, it just makes you yeah, great. You get more one publication more and that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff. But slicing it up. Yeah, yeah. but then it went, but I the, mean, it's one thing. The other problem is then if we don't do that, we have like a, a paper with like eight experiments or something, and that's that also doesn't help anyone to have this well long paper that you know you, you download it and you just put off reading it because it's so long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's too many variables, too many things, or keep in mind yeah that's why basically that, <laughs> when you read it that's yeah. exactly that's yeah. why I basically said like okay we're just going to do it as two things because then it's, it's just simpler to do from a practical perspective and work through it but um yeah 
uh, on papers on economics just for a second. Again, these are very nitty. <laughs> Basically, you're one, of, you're one of the first economists I'm talking to to have to ask all the annoying okay, questions cool. I've, I've always had. Okay, I have um, to defend the whole yeah, exactly. <laughs> field here. Yeah, um, like I mean, these are super critical questions per se. I think a lot of it's just differences in norms and that kind of thing, but it's kind of confusing from the outside sometimes. So uh, what I always found really weird also, I mean, you know, I said I'd like to talk about your paper about um, pro-sociality in, co and, uh, in COVID later. And what I, for mm -hmm. example, there found, uh, what I've seen in you know many economics papers is that basically your introduction is a long abstract almost, where the, so like if you look at the introduction of the, your of that paper, something like the first two paragraphs are what I what we would call an introduction, almost in psychology, where you outline the literature. Then you have like one paragraph of methods of your paper, then like one paragraph of results, and then like four paragraphs of discussion, almost. So that that's always been slightly confusing to me when reading economics papers. Why? I don't know why. Why it seems to be you have abstract, then a long abstract, then methods. Yeah, I guess, you know, the abstract is supposed to be something separate from the paper mm -hmm. and vice versa, right? So you should be able to read the paper in a sense without <laughs> reading the abstract, right? So I think that's uh, why it's structured or why this norm has kind of evolved, uh, I guess. And it's clear that this is, and, and also, I don't know, I guess, I mean, this would be interesting to 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 study i mean do uh, scientists of different field they probably read papers very differently right yeah so yeah. what parts in, in in what order what sequence in what detail you know you read but in essence you know in most economics papers if you read as you say you know if you read through the introduction you uh, get a pretty good you know uh, uh, grip of what the paper is doing you you know why this is important you know uh, what they are contributing with you know a little bit about the methods and you know uh, yeah typically you get that quite a good, okay. good overview um, i find it frustrating sometimes when reading papers from psychology really you know, okay I, I don't find the results <laughs> you know i don't find the the, the contributions it's just uh, yeah you know, goes on and on that I have to keep looking. I see that's that's funny because I kind of, um, I mean, not, not you know, about your paper specific, but like I've had this like in you know, economics paper where I go like, I read the title, which is a kind of summary of the paper. Right? Then I read the abstract, which is a longer summary. And then I read the introduction and it's just the same thing. I go like, guys, and then I read the results. So like, now I've read like the fourth time basically by the time I get to the <laughs> results. Um, oh, I can see that. Um, so that's why, I don't know, I think... Um, for me, always the or the way I was at least taught or whatever, I think the introduction was maybe you have like one paragraph at the end about what you do, but basically it's just mm -hmm. the, the summary of the field or something until then. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I guess that's why I keep looking, you know, because I don't find <laughs> yeah. this in the introduction. I have to go to actually read the full paper to find out what they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that again, that also and that kind of the nice thing that when I, you know, read the introduction of, of this COVID papers of yours, uh, paper of yours, it was kind of nice to have like pretty much most of it in the introduction already. Like it, in a way it does kind of, it is a kind of intermediate step of resolution between reading the abstract and reading the entire thing. Um, so that, that is then quite nice. It's just always unexpected <laughs> for, if you, yeah. for, for someone not from economics or who forgets about that. I guess it's also the same these days often when you go to seminars, I don't know about psychology seminars, but the economic seminars, you, it's almost like the introduction of a paper you get, you know, the motivation you get, uh, the contribution of what they do and a little bit about the method. And then also often, you know, a preview of the main findings already on the fourth or fifth slide. Oh yeah. I've, I don't think I've and ever done that. Yeah. In anything I've no, presented. So that's, <laughs> Yeah. Shall we start talking about the COVID paper then? Or I don't know. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Okay. Um Yeah, maybe as as with the uh, with your loss version paper, um could you provide like a I don't know, two, three minute summary or whatever of just like roughly what you did as a starting point for the conversation? Yes. So this was a paper about basically social preferences. So it's uh we wanted to 
find out, you know, if the things, in a sense, the things we traditionally measure, uh, measure and, and label social preferences uh, have any predictive, you know, bite or predictive power on people's behavior during this pandemic when it comes to, in particular, social distancing, but also other types of compliance to recommendations and, and, and norms. Uh, so what we did was basically to to run two uh, separate surveys with a representative sample of Swedes in uh, the spring of last year to year 2000. So during the first wave, basically in Europe, and um, we did one survey on social preferences where we tried to elicit, you know, the degree of pro sociality in different ways. So the main task was kind of the classic experimental or a variation of a classic experimental economics task, um, kind of a risk dictator game, we call it. I'll ask more about that maybe later because that, that was yeah. an interesting choice. Yeah. So uh, basically trying to measure, you know, how much, uh, how you how people trade it off, you know, getting some dollars for themselves uh, with, you know, exposing others to risk. Uh, and then we get, you know, an individual measure for each person here uh, on, on their sort of degree of prosociality. And then about two weeks later, you know, in not only totally seemingly, or we try to make it look like an unrelated survey, we ask them questions about COVID. So in particular, to what extent they kind of um, stay home when they're sick, we avoid, you know, social gatherings, they, um, what we more have, you know, we have them. Um, the coughing into uh, the elbow. Whether they avoid elbow, yeah, coughing yeah. into the elbow and whether they are, you know, following by the recommendations, more or less washing hands and avoiding touching uh, their face and so on. Uh, and what we do find then is so, so then we can sort of, and we actually also, these were all kind of hypothetical survey questions to also have some more, uh, you know, incentivized measures. We ask them actually whether they would like to buy one of these cloth masks, and, and we give some some money or some of the participants money to do that, so we can elicit their kind of uh, willingness to pay for, or for for that mask. You know, and we also look at um, whether they at the last screen of the experiment we provide some links. You know, where they can find information about how they can protect themselves and support the healthcare system and so on. And this is also not, you know, it's not supposed to be part of the experiment. It's just, you know, an end screen. Hey, thanks for participating. You can, yeah. if you would like to find out more information, you can click on these links. So we can actually also measure the, the number of clicks to those links. Um, and um, yeah, we also had some donations. So some of them, uh, received, you know, 20 euros and then, or dollars, and then we were, you know, asked to uh, donate part of that into um, uh, UNICEF um, fund, you know, I think to fight the COVID pandemic. So these were also a little bit more, you know, incentivized. We as economists typically like to have uh, some measures that are not entirely just self-reported and hypothetical. So the, the, the overall thing is then to see, okay, is there any predictive power of this measure of prosociality on people's behavior during the pandemic? And the answer is yes. I mean, it's it's really consistent across all, basically all the kind of measures almost we look at. You know, you find a, a correlation, a strong correlation between what people do in this kind of abstract game, you know, when it comes to exposing others to risk and what they claim to do when they uh, walk on the streets during the pandemic or when they not walk on the streets yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, during the pandemic. So I think that was um, um, kind of a clean, uh, straightforward finding. And, and we also had access to, for a subsample of these, we also had uh, information about or we had, uh, they had participated in a previous experiment of ours where we had uh, elicited social preferences using some survey questions. So we could also find that the, the measure, the pro sociality measure two years earlier was still predictive of what they were doing during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think then your summary was kind of that it's uh, a, a strong and stable predictor of reward behavior, right? Something like that. 
as in yeah. operational only works now, but also like if you look at it in long term, it seems to kind of over time, yeah, and across context. I think that's also the thing here, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about context yeah. dependence before, and whether at least when it comes to these personality trait or this personality aspect, it seems to travel across the context from the abstract lab to you know the the wild, uh, the wilderness of the pandemic. Okay. Um so maybe just because this slightly relates more to about the about psychology and economics so one big difference i think there's that in general psychologists don't mind deceiving their participants and in economics i think you're basically not allowed to uh or otherwise they won't publish in certain journals or it's at least not yeah not accepted so as much. Uh, referees uh, can complain and, and and so on and this is a long tradition you know i think these were traditionally the two of the main uh, differences between doing an experiment in, in economics and psychology was, of course, no deception and also typically incentives, you know, yeah. not just so hypothetical choices. Based on that, my question is, you kind uh, you kind of deceive participants, right? Like, I don't know if uh, the, uh, my question was kind of like I was curious. I thought like, okay, it's really cool that like you managed to separate these two surveys and make them appear completely different. And that people really think they're just taking it in part as a new study, that kind of thing. But then I also thought, well, don't economists, isn't that exactly what they don't like doing? Is that kind of, I don't know, was, was that a, something you thought about there? Or um, also that for the participants in terms of, I don't know whether what the ethics boards things are, but that they kind of didn't know they were taking part really in exactly what they were taking part in. Is Was that like concern for you or? It's something we discussed, but uh, since we don't, you know, provide, we don't lie to them, or we don't deceive them in that sense. We don't, yeah. uh, we never, I mean, the, the, the key thing here that people object to when it comes to deception, if, when, if you tell a story and that's not true, or you provide some information and that's not true. And after the study, they can, then the participants can potentially find out that this was, I was actually deceived or someone was lying to me and then they will get frustrated. And next time they come to the lab, they won't believe what the <laughs> yeah. experimenters are saying to me because last time it wasn't true. And that's not the case here. We did two surveys and there was a matching between the survey. Yeah, two yeah. surveys, right? Okay. I don't think we yeah. provided any. I don't know how you framed it exactly. I didn't look at all the materials exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, about the deception, that's, uh, I once had, a, I think this was like very, one of the very first experiments for which I helped collect data as a psychology, like undergraduate. Um, I, you know, it was like some attention task that's very boring to do. And you just sit there and like press buttons for like an hour or something. And then we, yeah, it's fairly boring to do. Anyway, after the experiment was finished, uh, the woman said, or oh, like she was also like a, a psychologist student, right? In an undergraduate and said like, oh, what was the study actually about? I was like, no, no, that was what the study was about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that was it. She somehow expected that, she almost expected that there was something else going on that she was not yeah, aware yeah. of, uh, which is probably a problem if that's the, I mean, I've only had that once ever, but yeah. um if that's part of the expectation of going in to doing that kind of experiment. Yeah, no, it's it's true. I mean, if you don't believe uh, what the experimenter is saying or you don't trust them, I mean, then, yeah, how can you trust the results in a sense? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Um, but so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, or, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, I have a few questions about the risk dictator game. I think the dictator game is well in... It's well known and you know well established, and people know what that is. But why, why this uh, variant of the dictator game? Okay, so this was in a sense, you know, trying to mimic a little bit more, you know, the situation in, in that we were trying to predict or explain. Because what we did was basically, you know, the dictator could. Uh, choose you know uh, or we framed it in a sense that let's say both uh, subjects here they start with uh, 10 kroners right mm -hmm. or 10 10 dollars that's it 10 dollars and then if i'm the dictator i can take a little bit more so i could take uh, uh, i could take um, 200 say that 
but that would mean or 20 euros are what, switching yeah. here let's say we have yeah, now, euro now we've got dollars <laughs> we euros and corner that's yeah. amazing <laughs> yeah, yeah sorry <laughs> we had kroner so but I'll, I'll keep it i'll keep it in dollars okay. right or you can translate it to euros so yeah we have euros in the, or dollars in the <laughs> Let's, let's you can also that. just go with the original if that's easier. I think isn't it yeah, corner? What was it exactly? I can't remember. Is it ten times? It's about ten. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's it's, it's so it's kind of simple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, in in a sense, you know, what we could do, what we did was, you know, the dictator could choose, you know, to to take a little bit more, to get a little bit more. But what would happen to the other person is that that person would then risk losing his or her initial ten dollars, right? You mean so, I can uh, decide then the other person will lose some of the money. So basically, you have ten dollars. I have ten dollars. That's kind of the framing of the initial situation. Then I'm the dictator. I can actually increase my payment, but that would impose a risk for you. So if 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 I take more, then you might face a risk of losing your 10 euros. Yeah. And in essence, I could actually take the maximum amount that would mean that you would lose for sure. I mean, not many people do that, but that's one option, you know, or some people do, but that's that's one option, right? Yeah. And then we had different, you know, benefits. So in the most extreme case, uh, we had that you could get, I think, 60. So... Uh, if I if I if you were to lose your money for sure, I would get sixty dollars instead of ten. So there were some substantial you know gains for me to to make. So we thought this is you know a little bit resembling what what's happening typically or the externality part of going out during socializing during the pandemic is that you of course expose others to risk. Uh, I might benefit a little bit from right. you know going. Uh, to a restaurant, but I also contribute, of course, to to um, spreading or potentially contributing to spreading the disease, making it crowded and so on, right? So that's why we choose this kind of risk framing, mm -hmm. because we thought that was a bit more similar to uh, the type of behavior we face or we were trying to predict. About the dictator game. Um, so I... Uh, it kind of relates again to the question of context and that kind of stuff. So I once did a study where basically I explained to people um, the dictator game and then they had to make decisions. Um, for practical purposes, I actually explained it to them rather than them reading the instructions. And basically they could ask me always questions. And the interesting thing is like at least half the people then said, oh, where does the money come from? Like I always, yeah, you know, I said like you're given 10 euros in a traditional dictator game to divide it between you and someone else. And half the people, they really were like, yeah, but what, like, where does the money come from? <laughs> and then I said like, no, it's just mm. given to you. Like you can decide. And what was interesting to me was that to a lot of people, just the first is that how many people, uh, not psychology students or anything, or in this case, they were prison inmates so maybe not the most representative sample <laughs> but um you know they were really like did we work together did we put in equal amounts like what exactly was going on what's the story here right and how difficult mm. they often found it to just decide in the abstract and then that that did when i was there make me wonder like how relevant of a measure it is if from at least a large proportion of people the situation just seems a bit absurd not absurd but um as if you're just lacking key information that would probably otherwise dominate any decision you could make. Yeah, and I'm of course I, I think it's a valid concern that this is a very artificial situation somehow. And often in these kind of situations, we would think about you know where does the money come from and that's the right or entitlements to these money and so on, how it's it's created and uh, or generated these money. So that's uh, that's a natural concern. I mean. In one sense, our paper is a, is a proof that it captures something, right, about human behavior or people's behavior. And yeah. this game captures something about how they uh, behave in the real world. Or they... Although it's still self-reported, right? Your, your behavioral measures are still... Yeah, except from the ones I measured, so of course. I mean, the number of clicks yeah, on yeah. the information. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and so on. So yeah. there are some, but, but, but it's clear that uh, most of it is self-reported. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I mean, I guess for your studies, maybe slightly different because this link between a abstract ex- decision and the real world is kind of almost what you're investigating, right? Um, so maybe it's less of a problem there than in regular. But t- to me, it was, I don't know. I guess if it is predictive, then maybe it isn't that much of a problem as it might seem. You know, it's just when I was doing, yeah, when I was just doing that experiment, I just kept wondering, like, should I, am I wasting my time here because I'm I'm asking mm-hmm. a task that it's just really weird and yeah. Yeah. No, I mean it, it is a concern. We have I have another whole paper on on the public goods game. You probably know of it's like the prisoner's dilemma, but with more players and more actions to choose from. And uh, there, you know, it's in a sense, it's it's so strange for some people that they don't understand it. The big fraction are a bit confused. What's kind of the the optimal strategy um, in this game? So a lot of people perceive it very much like a conditional cooperation is the the optimal strategy. <laughs> yeah. I mean. If you have social preferences, it is. But if we explicitly ask them to just think about their own, you know, earnings or their own payoffs, you know, and and then we ask them what's the optimal strategy for you, or what's the optimal uh, action for you if uh, someone else, let's say, contributes a certain amount, and then there is dominant strategy in reality, right? You should always just don't contribute yeah. at all and free ride. But most people, I mean, this kind of con- concept of conditional cooperation in this setting is kind of hard grained so most <laughs> people miss or about half of the subjects in that study kind of misinterpret this as you know the optimal strategy is to contribute as much as the other does which might be you know yeah so so a lot of people kind of get or there is always this risk when we when we have these abstract games as well that people misunderstand or are confused or have misperceptions about the structure of the underlying game you know, the incentives of the underlying game. Yeah, okay. So that was my question about the risk dictator game. Uh, by the way, just as a general comment, uh, I thought it was like, methodologically, I liked that, like a lot of stuff about the study, like, you know, large representative sample pre-registered. You had several measures of all these things, link like linking the different things without the participants being aware of it. I don't know, I just thought that was kind of a, I just I read the paper through like oh yeah this is well done. <laughs> yeah, thanks um, to my co-authors. <laughs> um, but now I have a very confused question. Question, which is, do cloth masks cost twenty five dollars in Sweden? <laughs> because I just thought so. You did, the decision was right. Like, do you keep? Or was it like you get twenty dollars or you get a cloth mask for twenty five? <laughs> I just thought, what is that mask made I think of? They, they, I think this was actually. Uh, well, this was the price in April on, really? on, online for for this particular actually this mask. I mean the the one literally that that you have as a photo at the end in the yeah. I, think so, yeah. I mean it's a okay looking mask. <laughs> yeah. But you know things that's uh, things have been developing since uh, <laughs> yeah. when it comes to the mask, right? Yeah, there was clear shortage of of the masks back then. I guess. It looks like handmade. This one, I yeah, know. yeah, exactly. <laughs> it looks, it's not particularly nice. <laughs> yeah, like for twenty. I mean, yeah. Okay, uh, I was just I wasn't entirely sure whether that was something you just made up or whether that was. But that's the actual price. Yeah, I think this was due to supply and demand. Yeah, at that particular <laughs> yeah. time point in time. Yeah. No, I mean, like in Germany at the time, there was. I remember in early April, still or no, late March at least. I was going shopping without a mask because I didn't have one. I just I didn't have one. I didn't know where to buy one. Uh, it just didn't mm-hmm. exist really as a thing. I don't know. I don't know whether this is like a. This is more like a comment of differences. So, I mean, like we did a study about COVID and doing risk perceptions and that kind of stuff, and we wanted to list, link risk perceptions to health-related behavior, similar to yours, just but we had risk perception rather than cooperative behavior. Um, but what we had was. Um, about these protective measures, we had basically physical dis- uh, social di- of, yeah, physical distancing and reduction of social contacts. And we had like one overall question about hygiene behavior. Uh, ours wasn't as specific as yours, but we just had huge ceiling effects. I mean, I guess you have it too, but less. 
so everyone was washing their hands all the time or i mean basically we asked like a question was something like yeah how much do you um stick to the hygiene recommendations in brackets washing your hands disinfecting and then later we had a mask and like 70 percent of people said like 95 percent or more or something um but yeah i guess i don't really have a question here um I guess yours is just yeah, different. I mean, we have up to, I think, uh, the most extreme ones, I think, is coughing and sneezing into elbows. Yeah, exactly. 70. I think 70%, yeah. but for some of the others are much more spread. And then we, of course, make an index out of all of these. So, yeah, yeah, you you're full. You have extreme answers of one or two. I mean, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, one thing that really surprised me is the where's a mask if symptoms? I mean, okay, point one is does not apply at all. That might mean people say, I don't have symptoms, therefore it hasn't applied. Yeah, you could also think about this issue because in Sweden, mask wearing was not encouraged at that time. So one way to read this question uh, <laughs> or misread this question might be, well, I don't go out if I have symptoms, so I don't wear a mask. Oh, that's the next thing. <laughs> because yeah, this, yeah. Is the, this is the, 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 the official recommendation is, of course, if you have symptoms, you should <laughs> yeah. stay home. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I don't have. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've kind of run through my list of questions. Um, okay, but I can also mention. I mean, relating to your research, I mean, that's we also measure risk attitudes here in this survey, right? So we could say something about also not only that there is. Uh, not only that there is a relationship between social preferences or prosociality and health behaviors, but we can also, you know, put a little bit in relation to uh, other types of preferences. So is that in the paper, the risk uh, perception? Yeah, oh. I think it's mentioned somewhere in the paper. Must yeah. have missed it then. And it's actually, yeah, so we, for example, we find that these social preferences are more important than the risk preferences. Uh, okay. health behaviors. Yeah, I mean, in our study, Which, we had the problem that we couldn't do that test because we had such ceiling effects that you know everyone just said, I, I mm -hmm. reduce all my contacts. Mm -hmm. And that one we split up in like different social contexts, like how many, um, the question we had was like, on how many days per week do you have physical contacts with, and then like your family, friends, uh, strangers, at, like leisure activities and that kind of stuff. And okay, from family, there was like a, uh, either every day or not at all, basically. Um, you know, either you live with your family and your children or whatever or not. Uh, but for everything else, it was just everyone reported zero. Like, <laughs> so mm -hmm, it was just we, we yeah. basically our, I mean, I haven't, well, by the, by the time this is out, there will be a new version of our preprint. Uh, but basically from what it seems right now and the final stages of finishing it is that we just can't make that assessment because everyone says they reduce everything. So... Which is good, I guess, for society. But <laughs> yeah, if if it's if it's if true, it were only yeah. true. But yeah, yeah. But also, I think you know, sometimes you know, I've read people saying also that okay, social preferences are not enough, and then people have don't have strong enough social preferences and so on for to be able to use this as some sort of tool or rely on this and so on. And of course, I mean, you're right. We need more restrictions as all. Well, but I also think it's. Uh, the fact that we need more restriction is not a good evidence that there are not um, social preferences because I think, I mean, a lot of people, you know, especially young ones, you know, they have, uh, um, let's say, restricting themselves a lot. And that's not due to themselves being particularly afraid. <laughs> it's probably mostly because of, you know, contributing to yeah. to the public good or to, to preventing the spread in society. So I think this is the fact that people for more than a year have, you know, uh, been, you know, isolating as much as they have been doing and following the restriction as much as they have been doing is in itself, you know, a sign of some sort of social preference. This is still being, you know, important. Yeah, the fact that there aren't massive riots all the time. No, yes, exactly. There are some, oh, of course, yeah. but it's it's usually a few hundred in germany at least it's usually a few hundred people maybe or something um it's it's not exactly like, it's it's not the mass movement you know and and um i mean for example like in the uk when i studied in the uk there were the like mass protests against them raising the tuition fees for students where there were like hundreds of thousands of people in the street we didn't see that for, for this right no and now you know students have been uh, 
away from campuses and, and most parties for <laughs> more than a year. Yeah. They're still, you know, uh, not going to the streets. So I think that in itself is sort of an indication that people are uh, have some sort of <laughs> concerns for others. Yeah. Yeah. Or I don't know how much like the, also the, the fears of getting severe symptoms, because I do know someone, for example, who seems to have gotten pretty, a young, fit, healthy person who shouldn't really have gotten anything, got it pretty yeah. bad. I mean, it's fine again now, but like it took a while. No, sure. I mean, it's a combination, yeah, yeah. but I also, I mean, honestly, I think that uh, for young people, you know, uh, it, it's, 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 um, it can be bad, but most likely not, right? So I think that the social aspects uh, dominate. The, the main concern is not to kill someone's skin. grandma or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, is this, I mean, I know you yeah, have no. the paper on vaccines and, or, uh, uh, that yeah, kind of thing. But that's the follow up. It's is there, I was just curious in general, like whether you have, are you doing more about this, about COVID and that kind of stuff? Or is that kind of more or less finished with those two papers? Yeah, we have a third wave of paper <laughs> coming soon. Uh, maybe, you know, yeah, we are planning to do something on, on, on vaccination as well. And hopefully we can get uh, uh, registered data from Sweden on, on whether people actually vaccinated or not. So that project, so what we're going to do there is basically well, the plan is to do uh, different uh, interventions both incentives, but also more kind of nudge style interventions. Uh, and then we can uh, link this, or the hope is that we can link this to admin data on whether people actually vaccinated or not. But couldn't you just so ask them? Can get, I mean, that seems like a question that's easy to ask. Uh, well, returning to returning to the issue before, right? I mean, we will, of course, ask, do this before they vaccinate. Uh, so we will do this as soon as as we can. As soon as we are now pending ethical approval, so as soon as we get an ethical approval, we will uh, launch this study and then we will follow up afterwards to see whether they're vaccinated or not. Okay. Well, and uh, of course, one benefit is that, uh, as you said, you know, these were mostly hypothetical, but that will then be, you know, a real decision, right? Are you going to differentiate so, between which vaccine? people are going to get and that kind of stuff because that's at least in germany i don't know exactly what it's like in sweden but in germany this is a big thing with astrazeneca being available not available on and off or something. yeah i think but at the moment this is going to be targeting the ones below 65 or 60 depending on how fast uh, ethical <laughs> approval goes but uh, uh, those are at the moment uh, not offered the astrazeneca vaccine so ah, okay all oh, right. It's yeah, only yeah. the ones. Mm -hmm. And it's just different because I'm officially at a hospital. So, I mean, I'm, I I think I'm higher up than I basically should be because I, I don't have really any clinical contacts or that kind of something, but I'm still at a hospital. Yeah. So, that, But I think for us, they said something like, we're at a hospital, even if you're under 60, you can still get AstraZeneca or something like that. But like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to wait for the people who actually have patient contact to get vaccinated first yeah, like yeah, it's exactly. stupid it's, for me it's, to get vaccinated sense, yeah. um, to, to, to give it to uh, more prioritized people yeah. first of course yeah uh, but can you through the through those records can you do they tell like when the people were vaccinated and that kind of stuff so you can really yeah so in principle we get the when and uh, where they were vaccinated okay well I hope so then we can yeah. I hope that not too many under 60 people in Sweden listen to the podcast. So otherwise this will ruin your, yeah. your sample. Luckily I'm not that Actually, big yet. It's, it's not a, <laughs> I don't, I don't. It's, it's common. Yeah, exactly.